It is insane that while we as a world have come to accept that discrimination on the basis of race, gender, and class is unacceptable and has to be fought with every cost, we have not come to the same recognition about geography. We see that you need to tear down borders because they are the last bastion of inequality that allows so many people to continue to suffer in a world of plenty. In a world in which developed countries cover more than enough food resources produced every year, where they have mountains of rice that rot away in European storerooms, it is crazy that we still have famine. In a world in which there's more than enough land in the United States to take in refugees, it is crazy that we still get turned away at the border. What we envision is a world government that essentially means the ending of national borders, which we see an immoral construction that continue to deprive those who need it of the resources that they need to survive. Our, our model is as follows. First, what we mean by prefers is that we prefer that this notion of the nation state did not exist and recognize that this is a notion that took root relatively recently in the 1800s when colonization began. We would prefer that at that stages of historical development that the predominant ideal instead turn out to be one of international governance but of course one that is democratic rather than one that is colonial. Some features that we envision for this world. First, we want it to be a federal system in which you know, pro probably will be ruled um, region by region rather than having one, cent uh, one centralized government that rules over every region directly. Each region might have sub-national governments, much like states in the United States. And we would support, for instance, and we also think it's it's likely that such a system would democratically lean towards supporting a system of proportional representation because that tends to be the one most people support is fair. So each of these sub-regions, for instance, uh, sub-Saharan Africa might have um, several seats in, 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 uh, in the national legislature based on their size of their population. East Asia might have several seats. Um, these local governments get to vote democratically on issues and each of their representatives will also get democratically voted at regular elections. We support the creation of a constitution not unlike the one that is in the United States. The federal government will still fundamentally be predominantly responsible for collecting taxes from each of these subnational governments and redistributing them equally to fund each of these regions, much as is done in many, in many regions of national, in, with, national, with national governments. Finally, we support the use of legislative power and courts to enforce agreement and assent amongst these, these um, subnational governments. So there's a subnational government that refuses to follow a certain policy, for instance, an anti-discrimination law or law to redistribute grain from one region to another. You can use legislative power to cut part of funding to that region, for instance, until they have compliance with this particular policy. Um, before I move on, yes, there's a clarification. Go ahead. Yeah, so just to be clear, these sub-national governments you are talking about, would they roughly be geographically broken up along current national borders? Um, uh, yes, they will. And I'll be explaining to you how this doesn't lead to any kind of perpetuation of um, I don't care about your problem, it's your problem kind of mentality, because this system is one that creates increased incentives for different regions to care about each other more so than in the status quo. Now, our first argument is about how this leads to a fairer distribution of resources. As I pointed out, our world is not lacking in resources. It is lacking in empathy. We do not lack grain to feed people, but we lack the care to distribute them to the regions that need it the most. We do not lack energy and oil. We lack the care to distribute them to regions that are most impoverished of them. We live in a world that is a terrible comparative, and this is what Op has to reckon with. It's a world in which Italy sends migrants to drown in the Mediterranean Sea, knowing that they will die. It's a world in which the U.S. sends millions of people back to their home countries in Ciudad, uh, home towns in, uh, in, in Mexico, in El Salvador, where they know they almost certainly we killed before the age of 50 by gun violence and gang violence. It's a world in which refugees are rejected from countries that they need to enter to stay alive, in which countries spend 0.01% of their national budget on food aid, resulting in massive famine and poverty. How do we solve this problem? We say that in this world, there's likely to be one in which governments of, of regions that are more wealthy have got more incentive to care about impoverished regions than ignoring them. A couple of reasons why. First of all, there's far more incentive for them to care in this world because it much more directly affects them when these regions do not flourish. You have an incentive to care for the least well-off in your own country and in this world, in uh, people in other regions, because it's better off for you in the long term. Because it means you can sell more goods to a prospering consumer market. You have to spend less on welfare for them. And importantly, you have less chance of costly conflicts or famine that might lead to unexpected refugee flows flowing into the borders of your particular region. So in a bid to stem this kind of destabilizing forces for more privileged parts of Asia, for instance, those parts of Asia will want to feed the most hungry in Laos and Cambodia, demine their fields so that refugees don't simply flood into those areas. This is vastly different from the status quo in which countries can get away with impunity, causing trouble and causing issues for other countries um, 
and, and, uh, and causing conflicts that they absolutely do have the power to resolve. Consider the inter multinational nature of conflict and status quo, in which countries like the US invades one country in the Middle East without regard for how it causes massive ref refugee crisis in neighboring regions. Do we say that they have the, the power to resolve them in status quo. They just don't have the incentive to do so. But we create that incentive when we make their fates more interconnected and more intertwined. The second way in which we solve this problem of apathy and the lack of incentive to care is about creating more mechanisms for legislative change, right? Recognize that in, uh, in, in, uh, in status quo, there is no real way for um, poorer nations or poorer regions to have a democratic say in what happens to money that will absolutely affect their fates. For instance, money that funds the US military that will gun down their civilians or money that could be better off put to feeding their people. In our, in our world, the majority are impoverished people. The majority of the world lives below the poverty line. The majority of the world will make it a priority to care about uh, food security and such issues. I'll take a POI now from um, uh, David. In the status quo, Nations exist in relationships of trade with each other where things like famines do matter for your ability to export or import. They do uh, care about destabilization of other countries because that results in things like terrorism and attacks on your homeland. How is your solution any different from what exists right now? I don't know what world you live in, but the vast majority of developed countries do not have this, their main trade partners, countries like Syria, countries like South Sudan, countries like Ethiopia, countries like Laos. They simply turn to trade partners that do not have these problems and they ignore the global South that language in these problems. We create incentive for them to care. Second, we create legislative change because now they can democratically advocate for themselves in the legislature. legislature. Thirdly, we create a cascade of influence in which sub-national regions might advocate for poorer regions by talking directly to those richer nations that they may have more connections to. For instance, think about how middle income countries are now more able to advocate directly to the United States, for instance, and therefore, by passing on this cascade of influence, advocate for those who have less disposable income to increase opportunities for growth. Finally, I want to talk about how we have better prosecution of war crimes and human rights issues. In status quo, there's a massive problem where there's a high international standard for prosecution prosecuting war crimes that is almost impossible to meet. We make it possible to prosecute these crimes when we make the standard for law one that is a national one rather than an international one. We're very proud to propose. All right, thank you very much. I'll owe whenever you're ready. Uh, hello. Everyone, hear me? Uh, yes. Speaker, the Prime Minister tells you that the zero sum nature of trade, economic inequity, and immigration is violence. We tell you that borders are the only ways in which lesser resourced populations can insulate themselves against cultural imperialism and extortion from most developed countries. On that side of the house, we think that the efficacy of this government therefore makes it one that is not desirable. I'm going to go into rebuttal um, and then into three constructive points. First, on how you get worse policy passed, second, on how you get worse relations between different groups of people, and second, on how you get more anti government conspiracism. That's going to clash with all of OG on their points about lack of caring, right? So for rebuttal, right? Our, our comparative here is that we think that the, the present system of like Westphalian sovereignty is a good one. We also reckon and, and, and like look forward to systems like the European Union or other regional agreements in which there are still strong forms of national government that have binding power over their citizens, but maybe perhaps uh, regional levels of government, separate national government that have uh, like some, some levels of binding character, but, but national government still retain the vast majority of autonomy, right? Okay. So, Colin gives you a lot of lovely principled analysis about inequality and rights, but I think insofar as we will prove to you that the pragmatic impacts of why national sovereignty bolsters the rights of residents of most disadvantaged places, we beat them individually, right? First thing I want to talk about uniquely that Colin says is that there are decreased transaction costs, that you're going to have like free trade agreements, etc. First, we would say weigh this against policy, right? Those decreased transaction costs, not having a tariff between like Malaysia and China, comes at the cost of Malaysia being able to set its own interest rates and accurately tailor its trade policy to like protect nascent industries that need protecting and otherwise protect workers from things like poverty and mass unemployment. We would say on our side of the house, because those gains are like so much more uh, uh, concentrated to individual who are economically at the, the fringe of being okay or not okay, we would pre preference this over transaction costs, which are spread 
out and diffuse against a large majority of the population. If they have to say for a pay, pay, for example, $1 more for a bag of rice across the entire population versus like 20% of Malaysia losing its jobs because it's no longer able to compete economically, we would preference having everyone pay a bit more for consumer goods due to higher transaction costs, right? But second of all, I just don't think that opening government is enough to prove to you that these decreased transaction costs are unique, right? They give us no analysis as to why the free trade zones that we have right now are not adequate enough to like decrease these transaction costs and solve for all of the sort of harms that they bring to you with regards to trade and economic costs, right? So I don't think that any of their benefits accrue there. The second thing is that the response that they get give to you as, as to regards to like how countries will end up voting and getting more rep, uh, representation is that in this like specific countries end up getting ignored in the quo, right? Because they're small markets and populations. If representation is proportional as they say it will be, that doesn't change at all. These countries still go completely unheard. So it is unclear to me by what mechanism you actually end up getting these countries to be better able to advocate for their rights on the international stage. Constructive then. Uh, I'll take a POI from closing if there is one. Closing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of being outcompeted by other regions that are perhaps better at you at a certain thing, like that also happens within nations right now, right? Like a particular region of a country is likely to succeed at one industry. Like, why are we not okay with markets just adjusting to a global nation? Yeah, so I think that the answer there is really clear, right? Like when you have like California specialized in like Silicon Valley and Ohio specialized in things like manufacturing automotives, sure, people have like the ability to move from California to Ohio. Maybe there's income inequality in that California is engaged in like a higher like level of productivity, a higher income pursuit, but you're like still not like di uh, disenfranchising and disadvantaging the mass majority of people because you have national specialization in which everyone is able to find something that meets their skill set, right? Okay, first point then on how you get worse policy facts past. First, on voting systems. I think that either you are going to have a bunch of dissension and gridlock in a voting system where everyone gets like one country, one vote. Think of like the UNGA, or you're going to have a few superpowers with large populations like the US, China, India get heard unjustly. Think about like the UN Security Council, right? I think that that's either one of those worlds is really harmful, right? First, gridlock is going to mean that you cannot deal with pressing crises like the white water crisis between Ethiopia and Egypt, right? First, there is a time skew in that it takes global governments, even if they are like just regional just African governments, like a while to respond more than it would just take the direct negotiations of like Egypt and Ethiopia, right? Second of all, you're going to have a difference of opinions um, and more difficulty reaching a coalition to have a voting majority in, able to, in order to like uh, achieve any sort of policy solution. And third of all, I think that less uh, powerful nations are just going to have less agenda setting power. So they're going to be able to bring up the issues that are impacting them in the immediately, uh, like at, at a much lower rate than they are when they're they only talking about their own national issues within their own national borders. So you're not going to be able to deal with pressing crises, especially those that reflect those with the least capital globally in the status quo. Second of all, I think that you're going to see hegemons like dominate the conversation. They're going to be able to sort of buy off and use their resource weight to throw around their, their, their like uh, political power, right? And you're actually going to see international inequality increase because these nations are going to be able to dictate the terms of the government on their terms rather than the terms that benefit developing countries. And then finally, we would say that recognize that every policy has policy winners and policy losers, right? Like for pro protectionism, for example, some people benefit, some people are hurt by free trade, right? In the status quo, nations are able to optimize based on what benefits a majority of the citizenry and because countries are specialized, i.e. high income countries do R&D, manufacturing, et cetera, most of those preferences are like uh, geographically agglomerated so that the scale of loss is minimized. At a global scale, scale, there is no way to minimize this and optimize because there's no policy like an interest rate that benefits the global poor and the global rich. Uh, I'll take OG. Won't it be in the interest of sub-regional governments to form parties to advocate for their collective interests? Isn't this much better than the status quo when there's no way for the global south to collect organize and band together to demand that the rich pay So yeah, share. I think that this is a hugely false and uh, like assumption, right? Like the global south has things like Mercosur, they have like the AU, they have all of these like separate national uh, like agreements already, all of these working groups at the UN, etc. All right. So Final thing I would say in terms of voting rights is that there is a tendency towards the lowest common denominator for human rights, right? That means I think that you're going to see a massive kickback on things like gay rights, uh, trans rights, et cetera, and now people can't even migrate to safe countries. 
Second th point of uh, material then is that you're going to get worse cross-border relations, right? I think that Gov's best case is like Lebanon where ethnic groups have like formal power sharing agreements, but the government cannot administer anything at all because it devolves to rent seeking and just cycles of domination of one group over another. The reason why the EU is able to be successful is because they have similar trajectories, cultures and de desires, right? That's also why there's like a stringent ascension process because nations have to be able to like uh, fit into this mo model, right? I think that on their side of the house, you're not going to be able to see the world function like the EU does just because they are diverging in what they need from a policy perspective. Final thing I want to talk about is how you're going to get more anti-government conspiracism. This clashes with OG on all of their points about lack of caring, right? Decisions are going to be necessarily top down. And when the top is that much higher, the decisions are further removed from citizens at the daily level. That means that the people who have shitty lives are just going to resent the government even more. You're going to see less ability to vote, less ability to advocate at the grassroots level. For all these reasons, proud to oppose. Thank you very much. DPM, whenever you're ready. Uh, DPM, are you here? Sorry, I was muted. Oh, okay, cool. No worries. Whenever you're ready. When asked whether genocide was happening in Serbia, the United States press secretary said, genocide isn't happening, acts of genocide are happening. The reason this happened is that this linguistic peculiarity allowed the United States to evade its responsibility under the uh, genocide treaty in the United, in United Nations to intervene um, during the Bosnian genocide um, uh, uh, in, a, in a way that made them evade their international duty. The difference in our world is that you no longer depend on political contingencies to prosecute war criminals and intervene in cases where major crimes against humanity are happening. This is because you can be tried not on the basis of whether a country wants to initiate a prosecution in an international institution, but rather on the basis of crimes that exist in the law books of the single world government and that can, can be prosecuted by courts. So in the same way that it doesn't take a crazy maneuver for a public prosecutor in the United States to say charge someone with murder or for someone to call 911 when there's a crime happening, it is now much more likely that th these things are able to happen because you have a much lower standard for what you need to prove in order to show that a crime against humanity is, is happening because jurisdictions will still have crime, uh, uh, will still consider it crimes to do things such as uh, organize, uh, 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 how, how do you say, um, uh, what's the word for this? Like things like attempted homicide or otherwise organizing people in order to commit crimes. These are things that you can now directly prosecute. So you no longer have to prove things that have a very high bar, such as genocide, which requires a strategic uh, a targeted attack on the survival of a single ethnic group. Lots of instances of genocide in history, for instance, have avoided international intervention because the perpetuating governments have said, we're not targeting one particular ethnic group, so you don't have grounds to intervene. Secondly, even if it's obvious in the status quo uh, that genocide is actually happening, you still need things like extradition agreements or a country to have signed into the Rome Treaty for it to actually be possible for you to intervene or for you to bring justice to people who were former war criminals. Right? You can just, if you're a terrible dictator and you can just remain in your country with your military in your pocket, it's very, very difficult for you to be extradited, which makes it more likely that you are willing to commit, commit these crimes in the first place. That's why war crimes are so much less likely to happen under our side of the house. This is super important because whatever you believe about the contingent political and economic outcomes in this debate, like whether specialization is a little bit better or a little bit worse, or whether the legislative process is better or worse than what happens in the, the United Nations. The fact that hundreds of thousands or over time, millions of people won't be killed by vicious tyrannical regimes like has happened all the time throughout history, oftentimes with impunity, is something that is very important. Let's, however, talk about what has been mentioned uh, uh, previously in this debate. Let's talk about how our first argument clashes with what we heard from the open government. Actually, before that, uh, POI from CO. Linguistic peculiarities decide Supreme Court decisions domestically all the time, like what privacy and militia means. Why is it that in a larger and more bureaucratic government like yours, do those linguistic peculiarities happen less often? No, no, no. 
it's not about like, whether something is a linguistic peculiarity or not. It's just that international law requires a high standard and therefore there are many, many ways to avoid that high standard using a linguistic peculiarity. So if somebody is, uh, uh, how do you explain this? If you don't know, if the local government doesn't have control over the military or the local police, because that institution is now, you know, part of the global government, even if genocide isn't happening, things like murder uh, are happening and many, many other crimes, things like, uh, uh, for instance, the fact that dictators oftentimes funnel drug money to fund their illegal activities. So it's much, much easier to clamp down because you don't have to prove those higher standards. I don't think you quite uh, uh, understood the argument. Let's talk about what I was talking about. So uh, Eva mentions things like, oh, you can do things like protect your own workers, set your own interest rates. Actually, I think we can still have different currencies. So at least many, many countries will be able to set their own interest rates, which is good. Secondly, I think fiscal redistribution is more important than setting your own interest rate. I'll get to this in a second. But I think one quite important thing is things like what degree of worker protection are you able to afford uh, for, your, uh, for your own people? I think it's likely that people in this world are going to want a higher, higher work, worker protections because people in the United States and Europe aren't used to working with the same standards that people in developing countries may be employed under, at that, for instance. So the base level of like the federal level of regulation, uh, uh, maximum hours that a person can work and so on is likely to be higher, even if there is some moderation in terms of what level the federal uh, country government can set. Um, things like tariffs, for instance, which Eva talks about. And how do you believe that this is actually good for the majority of countries that we're talking about? Tariffs are a huge mechanism for rent, rent extraction. And oftentimes, they don't actually lead to specialization because the people who want these tariffs are powerful and keep on lobbying for them. So the industry never advances. Then they tell us, oh, because we have proportional representation, poor countries, we're just never going to hear from them. Look, obviously there's a lot of diversity and variety between uh, uh, the preferences of people in developing countries. But insofar as we're just broadly talking about more or less redistribution, I think the populations of like Latin America, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Africa are just larger than the United States, uh, Europe, and Japan. I think overall you would have better outcomes. Importantly, what we hear about, oh, smaller countries are going to have less power. Colin asks the very reasonable question, can't they form parties together or coalitions? And the response is, they already do that in the status quo, like in Mercosur. Guys, Mercosur can't force the, the EU to remove its preferential tariffs, which systematically make it much harder for developing countries to export things other than commodities. They don't have power in the status quo, but when they are part of the same decision-making collective body, you are much more powerful. So why is it that it, collective decision-making is good in the status quo, but somehow it's not gonna work in our case when we give developing countries much more power, this argument uh, 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 doesn't make any sense. Lastly, the thing about like things like, oh, what about a dispute between Egypt and Ethiopia? Here's a great thing. In the status quo, there is no dispute resolution mechanism because there are two countries with two different separate laws. And it's not clear what we could use to decide who has a right over that dam, for instance. Under, uh, this is the type of thing that leads to war and conflict. Under our side, you can have a litigation through a court, for example, using whatever precedent exists or whatever law is in the, in the book of the world government, making it much less likely that inter-country disputes lead to war. Last thing uh, that we hear is that people are going to vote less uh, because they think their voice isn't gonna be heard. If this were true, we would systematically see that voter participation is higher in smaller countries and in larger countries. This is not the case. And I think voters would still vote because they have influence over local elections and their own like federal government. For all these reasons, uh, uh, very happy to defend this motion. All right, thank you very much. DLO, whenever you're ready. Thanks, just give me uh, one second. Sure, no problem. Um, so for POIs, if you wouldn't mind uh, just saying POI and then um, I'll take you because I'm not looking at the chat right now. So I'm pulling the timer. Um, I'm going to talk about two things in this speech. First, I'm going to talk about the willingness to care about other people and take out OG there. And second, I'm going to talk about the core of this debate, which is domination and conflict, why it gets worse on side government. First, taking out OG on the willingness to care about other people. Three things to note here. First, note that they never contend with what Eva explains in her speech, which is specifically that the size and difference in the size differences and differences in, for example, the size of different markets or the ability of another country to affect you 
never change under their side of the house, meaning it never becomes clear why suddenly I care about a small country that I fucked over economically just because they're in a legislature with me where they represent maybe 0.05% of the votes, even though I represent something like 10% of the votes. It's not clear why that dynamic ever changes. It's not clear why national government, therefore, ever enforces the changes that they want. But second, the extraordinary portion of the Gov case that is uh, based on crimes against humanity specifically is bizarre for the simple reason that people don't avoid doing war crimes because they're afraid of being prosecuted by the ICC because they're already afraid that they're going to die in a war because these kinds of crimes happen in high stakes environment anyway. At best, there's a marginal increase in your ability to be prosecuted. But I'd also note that in the example of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic was pr uh, prosecuted by an international organization without sovereign authority, so it's not clear why their advocacy depends on the existence of a world government per se. Look. I think the bottom line here is people don't want to give up their resources, and in order to get the national government to force them to, they need to be able to uh, muster the votes in the national government to uh, enact some kind of redistributionary scheme. Here's the fundamental problem, though. If it were true that people were willing to tolerate these kinds of redistributive schemes in, uh, uh, already, you would see that happening. Because the POI that I ask and that gets kind of shooed away from the PM is, I think, actually very telling. It is the case that countries uh, already have to internalize a large part of the uh, conditions of the rest of the world because they do rely on, uh, because, uh, uh, because they do exist in relationships of trade with each other and they do exist in these international organizations with each other. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about here is why you're likely to actually get compliance with any of the policies that they talk about. It's specifically because you get more anti-government conspiracism, uh, and this clashes with uh, all of OG's case. A few things to note here. First, the decisions are going to necessarily be top-down, and when that top is much higher, the decisions are further removed from citizens at the daily level. Note that your vote becomes one out of seven billion on their side of the house, whereas on our side of the house, you become one out of a couple of million, meaning that there are orders of magnitude uh, between how your uh, life, uh, how your vote matters. The reason this is important is because some individuals are going to have shitty lives, but now when their levels of government are even further removed, people are people can easily blame those faraway forces who put in place uh, the rules that have led to their lives being shitty. And this leads to a lot of uh, other uh, a lot of really bad consequences for political engagement. Look. In their best case, you can come to a consensus on some issues that help poor countries. The problem is there will always be an incentive for individual constituencies within the world government to defect and do whatever they want anyway. What that means is specifically, say you're able to like enact like a climate change accord where small countries also have to limit their pollution and industrialization. The problem is you'll always want to defect from that. They have to defend a situation in which Either they literally like enact militarily through uh, the, the sovereign or defund a nation because they're doing something in their in their interest, or a situation where they allow those defections to continue and therefore create a system where people are getting equal benefits, uh, countries are getting equal benefits, but don't actually have the same obligations. I'm going to talk in a moment about why that leads to bigger conflict and domination, but I'll take the POI. Okay, I think that you just flippantly said that they would have to invade militarily if people didn't adhere to climate change accords. Tell me why is that a bad thing as opposed to the status quo where people agree to climate change accords and then there's no mechanism for implementation or enforcement of that accord? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's not only military intervention, but also, for example, like defunding as the PM, uh, as the PM suggests. But either way, the point of having a sovereign is you're going to enforce these laws. They have to defend a coercive way of enforcing these laws, even if it means making people poor by like not no longer giving social benefits to this country or whatever it is. Domination and conflict. Why do it get? Why does it get worse? Note specifically that the only way anyone is able to ever get laws passed under a world government is if they're able to form coalitions of votes that form a majority. I think Eva great, gave great gridlock analysis, but uh, in this case, I want to talk specifically about conflict, why it's more likely to arise on their side of the house. I think there are two conditions under which conflict is likely to arise. The first is people view themselves as existing in a zero sum or trade off relationship with other groups of people. And second, that they have a viable mechanism to extract from one another and give to themselves. Under, uh, for, on that first point, I think government 
uh, the national government is going to have a finite set of resources and many area of needs that they need to cover. What that specifically means is that when the government needs to de decide if they're going to spend several billion dollars on alleviating famine in one area of the world versus another area of the world or helping defuse a like war situation, suddenly those different constituencies understand that their benefit depends on the defunding or on less resources going to that other place. What that then means is that whereas in the status quo with sovereign nations uh, um, that you don't view that uh, trade-off as existing, on their side of the house, you suddenly develop not just a lot of resentment, but also an incentive to actually do things like attack other countries that, that might benef uh, that whose benefit comes to your detriment. Why does that happen less often on our side of the house? Because of the second point that I gave you, which is the mechanism to extract from other countries. In the status quo, if you want to do something because you perceive that there's a trade-off, say like you're Greece and Turkey, and you're fighting over these oil fields in the Eastern Mediterranean, your main recourse is uh, potentially through military conflict. The, prob the thing is though, the existence of militaries possessed by competing nations deters countries from participating in military conflict in the first place. That is to say, the fear of death and loss if you go to war with someone is great enough that you do things like pivot to diplomacy. Here's the problem. On their side of the house, where suddenly the coercive power comes not from national level governments, but rather from a supranational government that can do whatever coercive mechanism it is, whether it's military, whether it's financial or other uh, penalties, now that there's a mechanism to actually enact that domination, you're going to see countries per become persistent losers or persistent winners under a global national government. The problem is then that suddenly you've entrenched systems of domination that don't exist when that military deterrent on a national level exists under our side of the house. And I think this is extremely important when combined with the analysis we gave you earlier about why stable political co or why political coalitions that dominate each other are going to arise. For those reasons, we're very proud to oppose. All right, thank you very much. Could we get the member of government? Uh, CG? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Okay, no worries. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, clock. Panel, opening opposition ultimately loses the debate because they do not engage with the transformative nature of this motion and still contextualizes power in terms of nationalism. I think that this is inherently a problem when they necessarily ignore the possibility of cross-border coalition building, when they necessarily ignore the fact that more people are able with the similar class struggles, similar languages, similar shared histories are able to organize at a legislative level that they have never been able to organize before. I think that at up until this point and within the status quo, nationalism and like tariffs and all of the other things that they have mentioned have been the best possible mechanism for minorities and people who are struggling within their national context to advocate for themselves because we have been existing within the frame of nationalism I think once we completely release people from the chains of their borders we actually get better advocacy for those people because they are now able to relate to people with similar struggles a world away very proud to propose I have two points of extension a lot of my reputation will be in person First, I want to talk about the implementation and enforcement of transformative legislation. And then I want to speak a little bit about global citizenship and why that is incredibly important for equalizing the vote and the voices of people who currently do not have equal voice in global matters. First, let's talk about transformative legislation. I'm going to give three points at which I think that this would actually just make the world fundamentally better. First on the topic of climate change, then on the topic of massive re uh, wealth redistribution, and then on the topic of borderless crime. Let's talk about climate change. I think that I do not, I hope that in this debate, I do not need to prove that climate change is currently one of the biggest problems that are facing like humanity um, globally. Um, I, if people like need more analysis on that, perhaps I'm having to give it, but I think it is fair for us to say that climate change is currently threatening the lives of people into the future, but also currently threatening the lives often of people within the global South through things that oftentimes lead to their climate refugee status. 
I would tell you that given that this is the biggest threat to humanity, but oftentimes the people with the most wealth and most ability to change it currently can't come to agreement on how to best combat climate change because the enforcement mechanisms are incredibly hard. So that means like things like the US being able to pull out of the Paris Agreement, even though they oftentimes contribute like disproportionately to the amount of climate change like emissions that occur. I think, and I think that opening opposition didn't do enough to tell us why it is not a good idea for us to be able to militarily enforce climate change accords if need be at local levels and at, at local administrative levels. Furthermore, I think they didn't tell us why governments like globally people are just more likely to vote in government that are advocating for climate change i would tell you that oftentimes at a local level people do not believe that there is any way to have transformative legislation for climate change because they recognize it as a global issue and that oftentimes their votes like at a local or at a national level simply cannot enforce anything at a global level to someone across the world i think we dramatically change people's calculus in terms of voting around climate change and also dramatically change our implementation and our enforcement Mechanism. Second, on massive wealth redistribution. I would say right now we have the ability, and this directly clashes with the idea that came out of opening opposition where they said we have a finite amount of resources and that's necessarily going to create competition. I think that right now we have the amount of resources to fix several of the world's hugest problems and currently do not do it because wealth is concentrated in a very small amount of people. I would say that within the status quo, right now, the wealthy is able to inf like influence political outcomes simply through the threat of taking their wealth elsewhere, which means that like the US is unlikely to ever put into place like very large like um, taxation, for instance, because the very threat that Jeff Bezos can just take his wealth to another country and therefore deprive like the country of the wealth is enough to stop people from implementation of those processes. I would tell you it is probably good that billionaires have literally nowhere to run in the world in which they will not be taxed. I think that is incredible for the way that we are able to dramatically transform wealth redistribution, not just at a national context, but also at an international context, because it now means that people who benefited from the exploitation of people a world away now directly have to funnel that money back into those communities. I think that's incredible. I think that's transformative. I think you only get that enforcement at the point where you have a world government that means that billionaires have nowhere to hide. Lastly, I would tell you that you get better combating a borderless crime that targets people that are most vulnerable, specifically things like um, like human trafficking, where there are different laws around like human trafficking and different laws around like punishing people who do borderless crime, which means that we oftentimes aren't able to like necessarily help those people. I think that that's really harmful. I think that Op says that we have to defend coercion. I think that we are okay doing this because even in their world, state coercion still exists at a national level. I do not think that I am, I necessarily have to be against state coercion or against state violence if it means that we literally get to inform, create better climate change um, proposals and um, legislation, and we get to have better massive wealth distribution. Before I talk about global citizenship, I'll take you um, the POI from Holding. Most powerful countries in the world already use the language of environmentalism to tell developing countries that they can't industrialize. So good efforts on your part are always weaponized to hurt the least well off anyway, because people like want to benefit their own capital. Okay, status. I'll actually address that while I'm talking about global citizenship, because I think that this lines up really nicely. I think within the status quo, the voices of the people within the most industrialized and in most developed countries already matter, not just at a political level, but literally at a local level, where if you consider the vote of someone in Florida, literally has more impact on the world than the vote of someone in Honduras and like literally can impact their destiny. I think that that is already a massive inequality that exists. Why do I think that we are likely to get better implementation of environmental policies on our side of the house? Because now the kinds of policies that are being pushed are policies that still allow for people at the lowest level of class to mark, like to galvanize together and advocate for things that allow them to have the things that they need whilst also solving for environmental change. I do not think that it is given that we have a huge amount of resources available, oftentimes an over concentration of resources available within the wealthiest countries, why that cannot be redistributed to the people who have the least amount and are now able to advocate for it because they now have the literal political power that they have never had before. I think it is incredibly important that the people that are consistently exploited by the West now have the ability to not only like advocate for themselves, but literally to vote for the policies that will be talking about siphoning money from the West. I think that this means that 
in Western countries, but also in countries that are from the global south, are more engaged within their political process. And I think this directly combats their idea about government conspiracy. Because I think that the reason a lot of times people don't engage within political processes is because they recognize, number one, there's a lot of corruption, but number two, that they simply do not have the ability or capacity to actually change the issues that are affecting them most, which are usually things like class privilege or literally things like climate change. I think people are more engaged with the political process because they know that their grassroots organizing with someone else who has similar issues the world away can actually make a change. Very proud to oppose, propose. All right, thank you very much. Can we get the member of the opposition? Yeah, can I be heard? Uh, yes. Frankly, I think the closing government case is lazy and ridiculous because oh, beat it in two seconds. So I'm going to beat it. I'm, I'm going to apply that response because I think it flows very nicely into the extension that we're going to give you. In the middle of the leader of opposition speech, we heard a characterization of how there are policy winners and losers. In the construction of any new government, it's important to understand that political capital does not reset. Political capital starts exactly from where we have it today. So in any new government that is likely to form, the political winners right now, the people who hold all the power, are the people who have all of the influence in that decision making. So yes, it's those superpowers who get help, who get heard unjustly, those superpowers who accrue and aggregate all of their power, and those superpowers who are going to protect the people who are the elite classes in those country. So there is no chance that you're going to be able to tax Jeff Bezos the way that they want you to. There's no chance that the U.S. is going to allow you to pass the climate change accords that you want, because the way that they construct this kind of government, the way that they're going to aggregate power is going to be one which is most favorable to them. I think closing government is out. One more piece of extraneous rebuttal to closing government. At the top of the speech we hear about how there's cross-border coalition building, which is possible to occur. This already happens when there is that shared culture and history. For example, it's why you have the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the Organization of American States. Those things already exist. They are already weak. And among cultures that don't get along and that don't have that shared history, they don't want to interact. Forcing them to interact is probably bad because it doesn't lead to any sort of positive synergies, but rather just a lot of loss. But don't worry, opening opposition, because I'm coming for you next. I think opening opposition can be most charitably described as a wet noodle, because what they do is they tell you that, look, there are perhaps likely policy winners and losers, because everybody is going to be trying to do good things, but it's just going to actually help some people more than others. What we're going to bring to you on closing opposition is that this is the greatest boon that could ever be given to the superpowers that already exist in the world right now. They're going to actively weaponize these kinds of things and use this in order to justify their actions and perpetuations of imperialism that you see all over the world. So I want to talk briefly about how political incentives broadly change for those countries and then talk about why it is so problematic that we actually have this kind of coercion happening, implicitly responding to the bottom of the closing government case. Look. The political incentives, in short, don't change at all. Because for all those quote unquote subnational governments, you're just preserving the government structure that already exists at the national level right now. So for example, US politicians are still catering to US citizens, so all their incentives are still the same. The difference now, however, is that they have a tool at their disposal, a tool that allows them to override things like sovereignty, a tool that allows them to disrespect the borders and boundaries that other countries have put in place, a tool that they are uniquely going to be able to weaponize. What does this mean? The first and perhaps largest implication of this is the same reason that countries don't accede to the Rome statute. That is, that enforcement is going to be so fucked up that no one is actually going to believe the legitimacy of it. They're just going to be forced to go along with it. So when countries like the U.S. are suddenly like, oh, this country didn't meet their climate change accord or their, their climate change promise, all of a sudden they're going to lobby extremely hard for sanctions or for any sort of like basically... Um, any sort of punitive measures against them to make sure that they aren't able to get exactly what they want because they'll use it as a justification to cut off their ability to access resources, to access aid, to access things that they actually need. And now, instead of being seen as a tool of foreign policy on the behalf of the U.S., the U.S. is able to couch this kind of thing and say, no, it's actually part of our broader government obligation. But say, for example, if a U.S. ally doesn't meet this benchmark, there's all sorts of excuses that the U.S. can now concoct to protect them and say, look, we don't believe in this case it needs to be enforced. And because they have the political capital to do so, they're still going to be able to get away with it. Every argument against the ICC is an argument against this government, because all this does is it gives you a codification of these same imperialist powers that are able to take advantage of those multinational organizations, and they're able to do it again. 
But secondly, I want to talk about what happens to the wrongdoing in these in a lot of countries because in the status quo what happens is a lot of times in order to expose wrongdoing at the highest level there are certain degrees of protections afforded to individual citizens namely asylum that concept goes away on their side of the house and i want to point out that this is perhaps the most unique thing that any team has brought to the debate because economic cooperation and taxation and tariffs can happen in the status quo but the one thing that meaningfully changes is the lack of any sort of established sovereignty of a country being able to claim that no this is our border and you have no jurisdiction here and the ability to protect whistleblowers specifically now is entirely gone why is it so important because the most rampant cases of abuse aren't ones that cnn goes and finds out on three Zakaria GPS and it's like, oh shit, there's some fucked up stuff going on, but rather the cases of individual whistleblowers who are taking extremely large risks with their lives and making sure that they're able to actually uncover these things with the promise that they will be safe and protected from some individual country. Because closing's out, I'll take a POI from opening. This is a preferred motion. So we think that if the historical development of the world followed one of a global government instead of a nation state, it would have been one without the imperialistic powers you mentioned. There are far less efficacy when solving poverty in South Sudan helps Kenya, which helps their trade partners in the West. And privileged regions cannot act with impunity because the poorer ones can vote democratically on issues that affect them. Yeah, great. I think it's very cute that you believe that just because you say the word democracy that everybody has equal access to the institutions of democracy. I think the US is a great example of why that simply isn't the case. There's always measures that people who are more proximate to the institutions and proximate to basically the pillars of capital that are always able to take advantage of those kinds of things, whether it be well, like we see in the US domestically with things like gerrymandering or other sorts of things like threatening people at ballot boxes. I don't think that you're going to get this utopian version of democracy that you claim will certainly exist. I think that you're what you're going to get is people still acting with the same perverse ex perverse incentives because countries and most importantly the leaders of countries are goddamn selfish so then how do you actually weigh what the contributions of the individual teams within this round so let's be really clear I think opening government gives you what we wish the world might look like. That is, that if everybody was intent on actually helping other people, that is what the world might look like. That is when this government might work. I think opening opposition gives you a soft stance on perhaps how sometimes there might be things that are wrong, but also assumes the same good faith. That is, they say that, look, even when best even like giving OG their best intentions, there's still likely to be negative externalities that arise from this sort of thing. On closing government, I think we get a repeat of opening government with examples that don't work for their case. And then on closing opposition, we tell you actually what the incentives of politicians are, because I really don't think that no matter how many politicians ever did collegiate debate, that people are truly utilitarian. I honestly think that politicians are self-interested, want to preserve their own wealth and their own status within nations and within countries and within communities. I don't think that the leaders in the UK and the US are suddenly going to start caring about starving people in Africa just because there's a global government. Instead, what I think they'll do is likely find a way to disenfranchise and like Ill illegitimize those leaders specifically in those countries in order to take advantage of their resources and cut them off in order for their own gain. The world is a fucked up place. The government bench just makes it easier for those people to take advantage. We're super proud to oppose. All right, thank you very much. Uh, can we get the government whip? Uh, whip. Oh, sorry. Yeah, can people hear me? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um. I think the issue with a lot of the teams in this debate is that they don't engage with the massive transformative nature of what this motion actually means. I think that getting bogged down in particular issues and just naming issues that result from this motion is insufficient to win this debate because the, obviously a lot of things change with this motion. No one is going to be able to prove that we get exclusively benefits or exclusively harms from the changes that result. Rather, it is specifically what are the most impactful or valuable changes that result. Therefore, the list of issues that has come from opposition with very minimal weighing as to why they are the most important is insufficient for opposition bends to win this debate. What are the things that we on CG think that you should care about the most? I think it's the classic metrics of just the worst problems that affect the most people, and particularly the most vulnerable people. Those issues include things like equality, inequality, uh, oppression, and climate change. Those are the things that are impacting broadly the human race and largely huge swaths of people that are typically considered to be the most vulnerable. 
Opening government tells you that you are likely to solve these problems, one, because you lose the borders that hinder these pro hinder progress, and two, because you enfranchise the poor. These are both true and I think insufficiently engaged with on opposition. What Harar then gives you is the critical mechanism by which you actually achieve that progress in ways that are far better than anything that could be achieved in the status quo. And that is specifically through global strategies and global planning. That kind of global planning can only exist under a sovereign, uh, sovereign global nation, and that is the only reason why we get the most impactful benefits uh, therefore listed. I I will admit right now that I will not get to literally every single problem in the laundry list of problems brought out to you by opposition. But I hope that the weighing that we bring to you in terms of the massive benefits from this global nation are far more important than a list of issues that opposition can present to you with minimal weighing as to why they actually outweigh. Just like enfranchising billions, like literally billions. Okay, so let's talk about closing opposition. They. I think broadly, the opposition extension suffers from being mostly uncomparative, right? Because they tell you that right now, uh, the US dominates and they will still have the most capital under a national uh, under this motion. The first thing, as pointed out by the opening government, is that this is broadly going to be normative, right? So they never really give you mechanisms as to why, like, from the beginning, the US would have still had this, like, massive imperialist power at the point at which a sovereign uh, global nation likely would have in intervened before that. But the second thing is that there's little reason to believe that even if we were to snap our fingers now and make this global uh, government, even outside, uh, even keeping the inequalities that exist globally, that this would exist long term, right? Because at the point at which you have this equalization of resources, you have an equalization of democratic power, it is likely that over decades or centuries, you would get an equalization of US hegemony. It is true that the US will dominate right now, but I think that largely opposition has suffered from being far too short termist in terms of what these changes actually look like in the long term. At the point at which you enfranchise the global south, it is far more likely that at a long, in a long term lens, you are going to see uh, far better equalization of resources. But the final thing is that currently the US also is dominating these relations. And that is what I think is the main failing of the CO extension is because they tell you that the US currently, uh, or the US in our world is going to largely dominate these kinds of discussions and have a lot of power over people. And they bemoan the fact that now we are uh, submitting national sovereignty and these countries can no longer claim their borders as protections. Literally when on earth has the US respected national sovereignty? Like there have been so many instances globally, where the US has not given a shit that you have a sovereign control over your borders. I'll get to you in a second. And I think that broadly, it is extremely unclear to me on opposition as to why like sovereignty is so important for imperial powers, especially if we're talking historically, because that sovereignty has never been respected in the first place. Most most likely, uh, and most uh, notably, in economic situations where often economic imperialism has no national sovereignty whatsoever and specifically requires democratic enfranchisement to combat, right? There is never any engagement as to why that kind of sovereignty is actually protected against some of the most pernicious forms of uh, neo-imperialism, particularly in economic circumstances. Um, and I think that that was quite damning uh, to the opposition case. Let's talk about global planning and what I think Harar brought you uniquely. Harar points to a number of global issues that are broadly borderless, things like climate change, things like global inequality. We t posit to you that a global strategy is the best way to solve these issues. Specifically, opening government says that it is more likely because the, the vulnerable are often a global majority. This occurs in things like uh, poverty and occurs in things like uh, people affected by climate change. But it is Harar that gives you the, me the mechanisms as to how these strategies are likely to develop. First, it is a reduction of international co uh, competition at the point to which the US is no longer able to say, we're not going to reduce our fossil fuel extraction because Russia isn't doing it, because literally everyone has to. And that is like, actually enforced across sovereignty across the nations, as opposed to people being able to opt out of things like the Paris Agreement. The second thing is that effective enforcement. It is the ability for a global nation to say, literally everyone must do this. And that kind of enforcement is massively important for global issues. Uh, I'll take opening opposition. Given that OG never models this as a counterfactual world in which there has never been a national government, what will cause individuals to shirk the national and ethnic identities they have been habituated to cultivate since birth, and we naturally form based on community identities, especially when a significant part of the global South already fights against itself and has competing interests? Yeah, a couple of responses to that. First of all, like, I don't think I really am going to defend like OG's model specifically. I think the motion broadly points to a normative change, but even if it's not, like, I'll engage in the world where this is not a normative change. I think that broadly, in a long-termist lens, the nationalism particularly that you see will likely dissolve given the fact that those national borders are no longer as pertinent to people's political enfranchisement and people no longer see other nations as distinct from their own. I think cultural borders and cultural identities will likely maintain themselves, but the specific cross-border coalitions that Harar talks to you about are likely to be uh, 
very impactful in that lens. Okay, so let's then talk about enfranchisement and engagement, right? Because open, opening opposition says they will likely be worse because your vote counts less and because you lack the agenda setting power um, that like more powerful nations will have. One, I think that agenda setting power is likely to equalize over time. This is for the same reasons that I've already given you as to why the opposition is broadly short termist. But two, I think that already you see a massive amount of enfranchisement simply because people are far more willing to engage in a government that actually has impact on them. Note that most people in the global south don't bother engaging with their government because most of the decisions that are affecting their lives are made by global imperial powers already, right? They know that their government has nothing to do with how the U.S. interacts with them economically, and that's what affects their job. The Malaysian farmers that are mentioned in the LO are likely to not care what the Malaysian government do does because their market is still going to be flooded by U.S. products. At the point at which they actually have control over what's happening across the world, they're far more likely to actually engage with that government. Finally, just broadly on the issues that I have with opposition is that I think they tend to not engage with what truly uh, this world is envisioned to be, right? Because the nation state is far less irrelevant, uh, far less relevant. That means that the cross-border coalitions that Harar mentioned are far more likely. The CEO response to this is truly like astoundingly flippant, where they say, those are currently not that valuable. Yeah, that's the point, right? We're telling you that they are far, they are now have so much more power because you can actually vote in a coalition in a global government. Muslims being uh, like uh, discriminated against in various parts of Southeast Asia now are able to actually vote in a coalition as opposed to constantly being a minority in their own nation, specifically because they band together across those identities. That kind of coalition building is massively impactful to those kinds of groups and solves some of the biggest issues that we have in this world. Proud to propose. All right, thank you very much. Could we get the opposition whip? Uh, Dennis? You're on mute. Yeah, I was, I was muted. Okay, cool. Um, is everyone ready? Aside from extraneous strands of argumentation, I think the main clash of this round looks like this. OG's like status quo is really, really bad. You need to deal with the comparative. It's gonna maybe make things better. I think OO broadly is just like, given that this isn't too different from the status quo for like six reasons, it's probably still going to be bad and there could be these other negative externalities that happen. I think we're going to agree with CG that this is radically different from the status quo, but not in a way that is good because of the way that power disaggregation actually happens. That is that they are correct in pointing out that maybe the most dispossessed people work together, but they don't explain to you why it is that collectively they'll be able to resist the ability of the most powerful who work together right now, who exist in oligopolistic competition such that they can't organize to compete with the oppressed because whenever the US says, hey, you, are not, you can't industrialize because it's gonna be bad for the environment, China's like, no, fuck off. We're going to compete with you and say that we're going to protect their ability to industrialize so that the people for whom climate change might not be the most pressing issue because they need to put food on the table and protectionist policies are keeping them from doing that. These are the people who are, we're going to be benefiting from. I think that that probably doesn't really happen on their side of the house. So two questions then, a deeper analysis into power aggregation. Secondarily, where can people run kind of like our clash of where it is that I don't think Jeff Bezos really cares too much. Rather, it is the case of the least dispossessed people using CG's own framework who actually don't have anywhere to run the analysis on asylums. Third, kind of some explicit rebuttal and weighing with OG. Great. So, oh, before I move on, yeah, CG, go for it. I think that the closing opposition characterization that climate change is not the most pressing comes from the fact that a current wealth inequality means that there are immediate things about survivability affecting these people. If we were to have massive wealth redistribution, climate change, number one, would be the most pressing. And also, it is also currently the pre most pressing thing for people who are like climate refugees in the global south. Okay. So first of all, Climate refugees are not the broadest part of the populace. The broadest part of the populace are working like subsistence agricultural people who are people who right now climate change is something that of course they care about. But what's more important is that the value of the things they are selling does not give them enough like money to buy food or things like this. 
So secondarily, though, I think to link into your argument about wealth redistribution, you still have to buy that you're radically changing the ability of people to hoard wealth in the first place, but that needs to deal with the power aggregation stuff that Tanay gave you. So first, an overview on the burdens of the round. I think OG Askis POEBA prefers two things here. First, OO is correct in pointing out that if they wanted to frame it that way, they should have like more radically shaped that in their case. I think their case mirrors the real world we have now, given their arguments oftentimes stem from a modern conception of how the world works. Secondarily though, I do not think their analysis of where imperialism comes from is true. Yes, the nation state has been like weaponized to do these specific things, but broadly we would say imperialism is an extension of human self-interest and a unfair and random uh, aggregate, uh, uh, distribution of resources in the world. If you just live along like a specific river valley and have more money and more ability to eat food, which lets you become smarter, things like this, or just band with other people who also have those same backgrounds, and then you will then further oppress other people. Maybe it doesn't look specifically like the borders of the nation state, but you don't need borders to oppress people. Multinational corporations do it all the time, and now there is just going to be less competition to check that on your side of the house. So first, power aggregation. What does it look like when the most powerful work together, the arguments that Tanae gave you? A couple of things here. First, I think it is likely the case that the groups that you want to have organized on yourself have less collective power relative to those larger groups. Oh, yeah, OG. Yeah. If politicians in the US care as little about people in other countries as they do in status quo, how on earth is your world where refugees are turned away at the border better? We at least make it more likely that they have to pay taxes to these other regions, that they cannot hoard rice and wealth for themselves, and that they have to unquestionably accept refugees because they're part of the same country. Okay. I think a big line out of the government bench again is like, look, the United States doesn't care in the status quo. Fair. I think they do take a fair amount of refugees. Other countries that aren't the United States that are pretty powerful because they're more proximate to those places also take a lot of refugees. We're just going to argue that they're more likely to do this. But on your side of the house, we also think it's easier for them to shirk responsibilities and take advantage of this world government, right? So a couple of things here. First, what does accountability look like in the status quo? Yes, the United States is not perfect, obviously, but it is other powerful countries that have competitive incentives to check them that keeps them from doing things. CF, the example I gave earlier, right? There's less accountability for bad faith arguments that weaponize the language of like labor rights movements to take advantage of people. CF, how environmentalism and the status quo in places like San Francisco is literally used to deny the least well off housing. It is also used to deny the ability of other countries to industrialize because there are carbon caps that are placed on them that then say you can't do that. This is much worse on the government side of the house because I think at the case where, as OO points out, the power distributions are just so disparate that the people at the top can shape how it is that people at the bottom view environmentalism in the way that we want to do it. It is not enough for closing government to come up here and just assert that the way that people will galvanize is the way that they want to because the frame by which they view how we should deal with environmentalism will be shaped by this huge world government that stands at the top and there will be nothing really to check that because I don't know what they'll be able to. On the comparative, yes, some labor rights movements right now aren't able to get much change. But I actually think it is the case that in smaller countries where the disparate level between the people and the overall government is much, much smaller because these are less developed countries with more unstable regimes, we can actually have effective things like coups and revolutions that we think are good. Coups like the one in Mali and Mauritania that we think actually benefited those countries literally cannot happen on their side of the house because people cannot overthrow their shackles because there are not a lot of small, potentially bad governments that we need to overthrow. Rather, the only way for them to achieve solvency is to massively change the entire big government because there are no smaller groups by which we can change and that just will not happen. Second question then, where are people going to run? If you want to atomize this debate to the least well off, one, Jeff Bezos doesn't need like tax havens to put his things in. The fact of the matter is that capitalism, insofar as no one is achieving a radical overthrow of capitalism, is such that the largest corporations can just take advantage of huge tax loopholes ever anyway, and unions won't organize. More importantly, it is the least well-off people who are oppressed by small regimes that are the ones who are hurt on their side of the house because the path by which we can save them is twofold. Either one, they can go to another country that is impossible on their side of the house because they don't give you a, another place for them to go or anyone would take them. But secondarily, the least well off actually have a bad guy that they can fight. Yes, those things are bloody and brutal, but the comparative is like, I just literally do not know what agitation or challenging these power structures looks like in the gov world, absent some kind of like, like radical mass global unionized protest. But as Tanae and I already point out, when you let all the like bad guys work together too, it prevents that from happening. For all of these reasons, proud to oppose.
All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is obviously a closed round, so you guys won't be getting results after. Uh, so